Good morning. And welcome to the service of worship at First Presbyterian Church. We're delighted that you are here and look forward to a rich time of worshiping and praising God together. I would invite you to please sign the friendship rosters that are found in each pew and pass them along. Be sure you get yourselves acquainted to, with anyone that you may, uh, may not already know. Um, moment of celebration here today. The, uh, the rose here on the lectern is in honor of the birth of uh, Lily Allen Scully, uh, uh, daughter of uh, Jess Kuyala and Jamie Scully, and granddaughter of John and Chris Scully. So we welcome, welcome her into our extended church family. I hope many of you had a chance to uh, take advantage of the cyber fair today, if you didn't do it last week. This is really intended to get you acquainted with uh, what's going on in our church life, to uh, understand a little more about opportunities there are to serve the church. And uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, seeing many of you walking around with your bags here in, uh, in uh, Food Lion or uh, Martin's. And uh, as, if you complete that little task, uh, you can do it at home and, or here in church. The uh, cyber fair will be set up for another couple of weeks, right, or at least one more week. Good, thank you, Libby. Uh, adult Sunday school classes began today. If you didn't have a chance to join one, you're certainly more than welcome to do, uh, do that next week. Uh, we we'll call your attention to lots of other announcements in the bulletin. We began our midweek uh, program uh, this past Wednesday. Uh, there's dinner every Wednesday night. Uh, you know, if you have kids in choirs or in the evening points, feel free to come. But even if not, if you just want to kind of a, a moment away, a time you don't have to cook, come down and join us for for supper. Uh, on that back page as well, there are pictures of two of the women who are going to be visiting us from Guatemala as part of this exchange uh, coming up in October. And so uh, please get acquainted with them. We look forward to welcoming them here in our church family. Mark Donaldson has a moment for drama. That's not usually something you hear about me, drama. Hey, good morning. Um, good morning. Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, good morning. First Presbyterian Church this holiday season is going to be presenting the play, The Best Christmas Pageant Ever. And if you haven't ever heard about that play, I just want to read you the opening scene. The Herdmans were the worst kids in the whole history of the world. They lied, they stole, and they smoked cigars, even the girls. They talked dirty and cussed their teachers and took the name of the Lord in vain and set fire to Fred Shoemaker's old broken down tool house. So that's the Herdmans. What does that have to do with Christmas here at First Presbyterian Church? I'd like to invite you to get involved in this production to find out. We need a lot of people. We need little kids not so little kids, bigger kids, grown up kind of kids. Uh, to be on stage, we need people who are interested in helping with costumes, with lighting, with sets, with keeping the kids busy on those evenings when we've got 30 kids running around. Uh, I will be standing outside at the table, uh, outside the door here after church with some information about uh, when we're having tryouts next week, when the production is, December, uh, now my b brain just went blank, so I'm going to let this go. Thank you very much. I hope to see you outside. Thank you, Mark. And if you're not familiar with that, that story, The Greatest Christmas Pageant Ever, you want to pick it up and read it, and then uh, think about taking part in this production. This should be a lot of fun for our church, church family to be involved in. So let us now prepare our hearts and minds to worship the living God.
thank you for leading us so beautifully into worship. Let us join in the responsive call to worship. Sisters and brothers in Christ, let us present ourselves to the Lord. We are many members with many different gifts. Let us pray. O oh Lord, during this time of worship, help us to understand more fully what it is to love you with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. Help us to love you not only with our lips but also with our lives. Help us to be challenged to live lives that demonstrate that all that we are and all that we have is yours. Help us to move from making declarations of love for you in church to showing open deeds of love for you wherever we are in our daily life in the world. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The proof of God's amazing love is this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. In faith and penitence, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Let us pray together. God, our, our Redeemer, Redeemer, we confess that we, that we remain captivated, captivated by, by sin. sin. You, you move heaven, heaven and, and earth to save us. us but we remain largely unmoved by the suffering of others. You are willing to forgive again and again, but we are so often unwilling to forgive the debts of others. Forgive us, free us. Let us be no longer bound by sin, but released, restored, set free to worship and serve you in freedom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Amen. Hear now the good news. Who is in a position to condemn us? Only Christ, and Christ died for us, Christ rose for us, Christ reigns in power for us, Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation, and the old life has gone, and a new life has begun. And so, friends, believe this good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Please be seated. We'd invite any of the elementary age children and younger to come down for the uh, children's message with Todd. Good morning. Well, usually I have my brown paper bag, uh, but today what I have brought um, for us to look at doesn't fit in a bag, and if it did, I was afraid it might tear right through the bottom. Uh, but today I wanted to talk a little bit about some tools. So what do we use tools for? Fixing things. Fixing things. That's one thing we use tools for. What's another thing we might use tools for? Building things. So tools are used to build and to fix. Um, so last Sunday, we said that God is building his kingdom here on earth. And God is at work not only building, but also fixing the things in our world that are broken. And so God has all the right tools for the job. But God's tools aren't like the tools that I have in this box. These are my tools that I might use to build or fix at my house. So I have things like a hammer that I could use to um, put nails into a board. I have, or wood. yeah, or wood. I have a level to make sure that things are, are hanging straight and that they're flat. I have a utility knife. I could cut things out with that. I have a, lots of different tools. I have a screwdriver to put screws in or pliers to maybe to remove something. So I have lots of tools. Or to pull on wires. Or to pull on wires. So there's lots of things that I could do at my house with these tools. But these tools aren't really at all like God's tools. You know what God's tools are? God's tools are people. So each of you and each member of our congregation and Christians everywhere are God's tools for God to do his work. And so my work is fixing things or building things around my house. But God's work is building his kingdom, is fixing the things in our world that are broken. God's work for us as his tools is to make disciples so that, that each Christian can live the way God wants us to live. Um, so we are God's tools, and so the church is kind of like God's toolbox. Um, so God doesn't intend for us to work by ourselves or alone. God is with us, and God wants us to work together um, with, with our friends and with our brothers and sisters in Jesus. Um, so the church is where we gather together, ready to do God's work. And through the church, God makes us ready to serve him and, and do the work that he has for us to do. Um, so God is building his kingdom and fixing the things in our world that are broken through people 
who are his tools um, in the fellowship of the church, which is like his toolbox, all right? So if you would join me in a word of prayer and congregation, if you would pray along with us. Let's pray. Dear Lord, Dear Lord use us as tools to build your kingdom. Fix this, world. fix this world. Thank you for the church. Thank you for the church. Where we can be together to serve you. Where we can be together to serve you. Amen. Amen. Alright, thank you for joining me today. Okay, thank you so much. You may go back to your folks now or out to We Wands Worship. And while they're doing that, let's spend a moment passing the peace and greeting each other in the name of Jesus. We began last week our sermon series for the year on the theme, The World God is Building, A Fresh Look at the Kingdom of God. And that song that uh, we sang is going to be our theme song for a while as it focuses on the importance of understanding we're all called to live as light and be the light in God's kingdom. So I know it'll take us a few weeks to get uh, familiar with it, but uh, it's a beautiful song and with a beautiful message. We look today at the very end of uh, the Gospel of Matthew, the last words that Jesus gives us. This is Matthew 28. Listen to God's word. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. 
And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord shall stand forever. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. So, why the church? It's a natural question when it seems clear that Jesus didn't come to establish a new church. He didn't come to establish an institution, but rather to initiate a movement. Last week, in, our first, in the first of our year-long series on the world God is building, a fresh look at the kingdom of God, we hammered home the message that Jesus came preaching the initiation of God's kingdom, a dynamic, revolutionary movement of the Spirit. And yet in the minds of many, what was an effort of Jesus to renew the world simply degenerated into the church. A church too often dull and static, a church, at least if we listen to the opinion of Gen Xers and millennials, a church which doesn't take the radical message of Jesus seriously enough, a church which becomes tradition bound and narrow, a church too often reflecting the politics of the day, whether conservative or liberal, a community seemingly preoccupied with sex. So, why the church? Why do we need it? What good does it do? Can't we just get on with the business of trying to follow Jesus, join with him, him in turning the world upside down by learning how to live compassionately and being a voice of justice and mercy in a sometimes hard and unforgiving world? Now, it's hard not to get excited about Jesus when we cut through the layers of cult, uh, cultural convention and meet him again as for the first time. Last week, we encountered him at the beginning of a ministry which would constantly keep him on the go, moving from place to place, teaching and healing and bringing and enacting the good news of God's reign. We heard his first words last week. We looked at the very first things he said. Now we hear his last words, his benediction, in which he gives his followers an assignment. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This, of course, is known as the Great Commission. Jesus is sending his followers out into the world with one overriding purpose, to make disciples. So why the church? At one level, it's really quite simple. It's all part of God's plan. It's the means by which God directed that we should carry out this all-important assignment which is not just getting more people into the pews, not just singing a few hymns, not just learning a little bit about how to be nice to one another, though that's always a good thing to do, but rather building disciples who go out into the world to join with Jesus in turning the world upside down, creating a new order shaped by God's ways of forgiveness and justice and compassion and hope. The church is given an assignment of being a witness to and a provisional demonstration of God's coming kingdom. It's a big task, no minor assignment. Now notice the very first word in this assignment is the word go. Jesus is always on the move in the Gospels, and you get the feeling that the disciples are actually having to run breathlessly behind him just to keep up with him. Jesus is forming a movement of people who trust him and who believe his message and want to, want to take it to a world in which they live. Jesus calls us through the church to a way of life which is not a belief system, 
though we have important beliefs. Jesus calls us through a church to a way of life which is not just a series of religious rituals, though there are important practices which shape us. The picture, this picture of Jesus on the go, telling us to go, provides a, a, a contrast to some other understandings of faith. In this pluralistic world of ours, I find a, a lot of people are interested in the claims of other religions. And certainly we recognize that there are good and caring and compassionate people in all faiths, but there are differences between our different traditions. I was talking not long ago to one of our college students who had gotten at college interested in Buddhism, a very appealing faith in this time of high stress and anxiety. Many of you have seen uh, pictures or statues of the Buddha, haven't you? Uh, the Buddha is always portrayed sitting serenely on a lotus blossom with a faint smile on his face, hands resting placidly on his folded knees. Entering into this world, into this world of the Buddha, is presumably entering into a world of peace and security and serenity and passivity. Appealing in many ways. But the image of Jesus in the Gospels is quite different, isn't it? He is on the move, full of action, energy, always entering into the world rather than pulling out of the world, moving even into the pain of the world. Jesus, of course, found times to step back from the world and be renewed in prayer, but only in order to plunge back in. Go, make disciples, baptize, teach, Disciples who seek to follow him are expected to go and enter into this world and leave it a different and better place. We're expected to shape the world with the values of his kingdom. And sometimes we in the mainline churches have forgotten that imperative. We frankly have gotten rather content with the people we already have here in our churches rather than going out with the message of Jesus to where Jesus goes. Do you know what the average age of we Presbyterians is? The average age of our congregations, it's I believe 58, 58. And although we're doing better than many Presbyterians, churches in attracting young families, that's not a good sign. You know, we have to guard against simply settling into providing good consumer services for those who show up rather than reaching out, inviting, welcoming. The church has an important assignment which is fundamentally out there, beyond the wor wor uh, walls of the church. It's an assignment which takes us to our places of work, to our schools, to our communities. Nevertheless, it is also true that this passion, the passion for being emissaries of God's transforming kingdom, depends on us being shaped within a community of believers. This is also the church's assignment because it's within that community that we come to understand what it is to be a disciple and develop the practices which enable us to be the kind of people who know how to try to break down barriers and to learn to love even enemies and to work to overcome injustice and to show compassion for the least and lost at the margins and who, who demonstrate a humility that doesn't assume they have Jesus' fixed and final word on all things. The church is God's chosen instrument. It is where most of us came to know the good news, not necessarily because we chose to be such attentive listeners, but because God chose us through it. As a young child, I probably, like many of you, didn't really get it. I wondered what the purpose of all this church business was as I was brought to the sanctuary periodically. Indeed, I never thought of the church as somehow being a chosen instrument of a God on the go, initiating a revolutionary new kingdom in my world. It was just a place where people seemed to come and people talked a lot about God. I can't remember much about the Methodist church that I attended sporadically during my elementary years, except rather long sermons and sometimes even longer prayers 
prayers which somehow always seem to include thanking God for letting us be here today, which to a boy of seven or eight struggling to be still and quiet in the pew seemed a dubious act of grace. But one thing I did remember were the words of Helen Dutcher, my fourth grade Sunday school teacher, who was also my Cub Scout den leader. We met in this dark, dank room in the basement of the church, which had only one tiny window at the, at the top. You've been in basement rooms like, like that, up near the ceiling. And we'd have prayer time. And Mrs. Dutcher would always say, now, if you have a hard time paying attention, and I did, you know, just look at this picture of Jesus. And remember, it was, it was Solomon's famous head of Christ. You know, every, every church has one of those somewhere. I'm not sure where it is in our building, but it's around here. Solomon's head of Christ. And, and remember, look at that picture and remember, Jesus loves you. And many a Sunday, I just stared at that picture. And later on up in church, I stared at the stained glass window over the communion table as a, it was a stained glass of Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, sweat like ble beads of blood pouring from his forehead, as it says in Luke's Gospel. It was an inauspicious beginning to a life of faith, but a beginning it was, and it wouldn't have happened without the church being there as God's vessel. I love the church, but I know that for many people, it can be a stumbling block. Poet Robert Southey said, I could believe in Jesus were it not for his leprous bride, the church. A comment attributed to Augustine was even more harsh. The church is a harlot, but she's also our mother. And both comments you see are making the point that the church, recognizing the point that the church has been unfaithful as the bride of Christ, from time to time, it's been hypocritical and corrupt and unjust and abusive and intolerant. But still, in God's amazing grace, it is that community which also heals, restores, renews, strengthens, provides the hope that comes only through Jesus. And that means that the reality is that the church is both glorious and messy. The church is disappointing and enriching. The church is exasperating and energizing. The description we often make of the church being a family, frankly, is not far from the mark if we understand the way families really are, not our mythical conception of families, but the ways they really are. Because my guess is that for most of us, there are times that our families drive us crazy. You know, why can't Cousin Joe just shape up and accept family norms? Why does he always have to say those things at the Thanksgiving dinner table? Why does my grandmother always seem so judgmental and put conditions on her expressions of love? Why does my mother let my sister get away with murder? You know, why does this one keep messing up and, and or not shaping up in the way that I think they should. You know, we wonder about the church family in the same way. You know, admit it, doesn't the church family sometimes drive you crazy? You know, why don't these people behave like I think they should? You know, haven't they heard my sermons? I find myself saying, you know, or, you know, why doesn't my minister agree with me? Or why does this person seem to be so unforgiving? Why does that person engage in gossip again and again? Why isn't the church a more complete example of the Christian community I envision? Why, I think, forgetting that deep truth that we are all just forgiven sinners here, not perfected saints. The church is big and messy. The church universal is messy with all of its divisions and disputes uh, through the centuries. We're going to be looking at some of that in that turning point class that I'm, I'm doing in Sunday school. The Presbyterian church is messy and sometimes we are exhilarated 
And sometimes we are disappointed and hurt by the actions it takes. The local church is messy. And sometimes we are very proud of its witness. And sometimes we're not happy at all with some of its actions. Like a family, we sometimes have to deal with what we don't always understand or like. The church is big and messy. It is made up of people, after all. Someone told me recently that they came into church a few weeks back, and almost immediately they saw sitting there in the congregation a person who was their absolute thorn in their side in their working world, in their working relationship. She said, you know, I almost just turned right around on my feet and just bolted out of the door as fast as I could. I almost did that. But then she said, I, I guess, you know, I don't, she said, I don't want to deal with that, with that person. But then my better angels got hold of me and uh, the, I, I stayed in the conviction that the church is more than a collection of like-minded people. It is a family that we don't always choose, but whom we are challenged to love. It is the body of Christ through whom the Holy Spirit works. Do any of you ever have family envy? I, I, I do. I admit I do sometimes. You know, we look at some other family and we imagine how wonderful that family must be. You know, they, they, have, they have a much more harmonious and comfortable situation than our family does, much easier for them. That's, of course, we say those things because we really don't know what's happening in that family, but we, we envy, you know, that over there. You know, and that can happen in the church as well. We look to another congregation or community and imagine it's more lively or loving or perfect, and maybe it is, and maybe, maybe we would do well to learn from other examples, but still I wonder. Gadfly church commentator Nadia Boltz Weber suggests that we don't really know the church and how God intended it until we see it at its worst and learn how to hang with it and work through our differences and discover that it is not our creation but God's who uses it despite its all too apparent imperfections. When Jimmy Carter left the Navy and returned to Plains, Georgia to take over his family's peanut business after his father got sick, he began attending the Maranatha Baptist Church in which he had grown up. Now in the Navy, uh, Carter had experienced a much more uh, racially and ethnically diverse uh, uh, and inclusive community. But in the 50s and the 60s, early 60s, in Plains, Georgia, he soon discovered that he and Rosalind were the only ones in their 200-member congregation who voted a willingness to integrate their church should a black family present themselves. And this happened for a number of years as a congregational vote was taken on this. And many wondered why the Carters would hang in there with such a church. And their answer was that they knew these people. They knew they were people who loved Jesus. They knew they did really good and wonderful and caring things in the community. And they were the ones that had provided support for Carter's mother after her husband died. The Carters' commitment was to keep loving people they cared for despite the theological differences and what they believed, frankly, was an ethical blind spot. That's how the church is sometimes. When I was in graduate school early in our marriage, Lynn got very sick with what we discovered eventually was a, an ectopic pregnancy which ruptured and it was right before Christmas and we were so preoccupied both with my end of the semester work and with her medical needs that we just never got our house decorated or did really any Christmas planning at all. But then one day after we returned home from being with my parents for a couple of days, just a day or so before Christmas, we were absolutely blown away when we discovered somebody had come in to our house and completely decorated our house. There was a tree with all the ornaments and lights. There was a creche. There were garlands and candles. Who did it, we wondered. How did they get in? We later discovered it was a family in the church that we didn't always see eye to eye with. But that's the way the church is sometimes. 
The church is never our church. It's always God's church. God's chosen instrument whereby we are gathered to be nurtured and gain strength, but then sent out into the world. Go, says God. Go, says Jesus, who is always on the move. Go, make disciples who are faithful and obedient and loving. Jesus ends his benediction with what surely must be the most reassuring words in all of Scripture. Remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The promise of God as we respond to his challenge to be part of this revolutionary, dynamic, unsettling, but astonishing kingdom of his is that God will hold on to us and never let us go, even to the end of the age. Thanks be to God who gives us this victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Oh God, we pray that you would draw near to us in this time of prayer. You have told us again and again that your intentions for us and for the world is to draw nearer and nearer. And so we pray as we lift our hearts and our minds and our thoughts towards you that you would draw nearer and nearer to us. Lord, we don't always have perfect words to speak. And yet we know that you hear the thoughts of our hearts so that the Holy Spirit speaks on our behalf. Lord, we ask that you would hear our prayers of thanksgiving this morning. We are grateful for you, for who you are and for all that you do. 
for the kingdom that is breaking in all around us. For glimpses that we, of we, that we have of a new way of being in this world, a way of justice and mercy and grace and love. We give you thanks that you are working in us, that you are working through us, that in our lives we see those subtle changes as you are molding us like clay, that you are opening our eyes to the pain and the suffering in this world, that you are teaching our hearts to love better, to speak less and to listen more, to be patient and to be hopeful. Oh Lord, this day we pray for your world. And we pray, oh Lord, that your peace would come, especially in those places of warfare. We pray for Iraq and for Syria, for Palestine and for Israel. pray for all those nations dealing with terrible diseases, dealing with famine. We pray for all those who are displaced from their homes. We pray for all men, women, and children who are not free, who are enslaved around the world. We pray for all those who are victims of violent crime. We pray for all those who are imprisoned by addiction or mental illness. Lord, we pray for our nation. Pray for our leaders for wisdom and for justice. We pray for our church that we would be a place of love, of spiritual nurture and growth, of joy in a unity of faith. Lord, we pray for ourselves and our families. Pray for those friends and families of Bob Pierce who are mourning his death. We pray for Hoyt Riddle, that his CT scan would come back clean and normal, and that his surgery goes well. Lord, we pray for Patrona, the Guatemalan woman, who are we, we are hoping will come and visit us. We pray that her interview, her visa interview, goes well this week. Lord, now we bring before you in silence all the cares of our hearts. And Lord, as we ask you into all these situations, into all these cares, and we have asked our, for our way we pray, O oh Lord, that you would align us with your way. That as we pray, we would draw closer and closer to who you would have us to be and how you would have us to see our world. It is in Jesus Christ's name that we pray the prayer that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Remembering the words of our Lord Jesus that it is more blessed to give than to receive, let us return to God the offerings of our life and the gifts of the earth. Please be seated. Let us pray. Blessed are you, God of all creation. 
It is through your goodness that we have these gifts to share. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Amen.